Hello, my name is Joey Morgan, and I directed Doctor Who Evolution. Ah, uh, hello there. I'm Brian Corrigan, and in Evolution, I played the ever-mysterious wanderer, Doctor Who. So, I have been playing this incarnation of the Doctor since the very beginning of the novel adaptation, so this is not a new voice for me to be doing. This is the first full story we've done with the fourth Doctor, though. It is not my first full story as a Doctor. That was Time of Your Life, where I played the sixth Doctor. Uh, but this is the first fourth Doctor one, and this one was really, really rough for a number of reasons. A few including, you know, I I was buried in other projects inside the fandom and outside of the fandom at the time. Uh, I had reached a burnout with Doctor Who entirely. Uh, I was buried in schoolwork because I am a young man of 18 who was working on graduating high school while, while we were recording it this sort of winter. Uh, yeah, no, this was, this was a rough one for me. Overall, if you were to ask me if I enjoyed record the, re the actual recording sessions for this story, my answer would probably, unfortunately, be no, just because of how dire things were. Uh, it was it was very stressful working on this one. As far as as far as what I think of the finished product, though, uh, the final product, I think this is going to be a standout for us at Security Kitchen Productions here. Because if you didn't know, I edit the trailers, so that means I get to sort of glimpse everybody's performance and sort of like a proto version of the final product, right? right before it goes out, essentially. And I am super impressed with all the other actors in who are involved in this project. I think it's, it's gonna come out amazing, just knowing how much Joey has improved with his sound design over the past few years. Uh, it's, it's got, you know, it's got, it's just got a lot going for it. Like, the story's really good, the characters are done pretty well, uh, we've got an amazing cast behind it, a really good sound designer. It's like, not a lot can go wrong, and I think this is really just gonna come together like bread and butter, and I am super excited to see what other people think of this, because I'm, I'm in love with it, if I'm qu being quite honest. This is one of the few projects that I can say I did not enjoy working on it, but I enjoy the final product. And I can't say that very often. So I just want to give like a huge, huge thank you to Joey and Jacob for being so amazing and the rest of the cast for putting in an absolutely stellar performance and making the story because without, without everyone else who worked on it, this story would not be as entertaining as it is. It, it would not come together like it did. And I just want to thank everyone for that, because I was really expecting this one to be bad rubbish. And it, it wasn't in the end. So I am I'm really, really happy about that. Uh, I hope the rest of you enjoy it too. A lot of work went into this story, not just on my end. Clearly, it, a lot of work went into it on everybody else's end, and I think this has the potential to be one of our best productions yet. Evolution is a unique oddity in the uh, in the wilderness years of Doctor Who. It's a good John Peel book, uh, with, <laughs> which which is. Uh, quite surprising for anyone uh to, to anyone who would vaguely know his work um i think it's a really good mystery and uh it was one of the first novels that we decided we wanted to do for the for the missing adventure adaptations uh first off because we wanted to do wanted to do a fourth doctor one um we wanted to cast a sarah jane and if we didn't want to take the time and cast two companions at once our only two options were either this or Managra, and I was infinitely more interested in Evolution, and uh, I thought it, thought it was a really great novel to um, to do in these early Missing Adventures, the same way it worked really well in the early Missing Adventures when they were being published. 
My name is Jacob Licklider. I adapted Evolution for audio. The adaption process for Evolution is one where... It's one of those stories where we went in with one idea and ended up coming out with kind of another. Uh, Evolution, of course, is the second Doctor Who book to be written by John Peel. And at least when it comes to his original work, not adapting, say, Dalek stories, it's actually his best. You have an actual decent story here. And honestly, I, I originally going in, we were thinking, right, classic Hinchcliffe four-parter necessary cuts. But then we, uh, when I actually got down to the scripting level, um, we found it actually couldn't just, really did not fit that structure. Like, this is one that I adapted, oddly enough, like Genesis, in a very short period of time. I think it was like, I think it was like within a week this was done, really two sessions, I knocked it out, and it was, oddly enough, a lot of the stuff stayed. There are a couple of cuts, um, most notably, uh, if you've listened to the story, we don't include the perspective of the experiments, really, partially because those aren't really scenes that translate well into audio, they're mainly book scenes, um, and they also actually don't interact as well with the plot. And while well, they kind of actually give away the game a bit too early, they they ruin the very fun mystery. So we decided let's let's do let's really play into you know the Sherlock Holmes aspect um, of this being a murder mystery with Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, and yes, and oddly enough, casting evolution was I think one of the f- most fun Joey and I have had casting people. We saw so many auditions. Um, and, you know, so many performances really, you know, making these, a lot of these characters who are very much stock characters in a very good way. Like, you have uh, Faversham, the, the stock constable, our, our twisted villain, um, Percival Ross, who is who is our, our evil mad scientist, all doing some great, you know, all, we all got some great auditions, and we have some, some great people, um... And perhaps most impressively is that this is, you know, basically our third longer story after, and and really the second missing adventure to be longer. Uh, the other, of course, being Scales of Injustice, and it it was honestly amazing seeing everything come together and 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 all of you know a lot of stuff. This is one where we had to be really heavily rely on sound design. Uh, we have our second score composed by Antonio, who is just great with original music. Um, as well as just just bringing everything to life, it was it was really a different sort of project. Um, as as with any of the missing adventures, you sort of have that dis- different thing because we're not the missing adventures very much. While they will touch on dark topics, and evolution is quite dark. Um, there's a lot of violence, and I can imagine you, you know the listener's mind going to violent places. It never hits like uh, a, a new adventure does, and it you know the tone is very much we're back in the mid '70s on on television, hopefully trying to you know scare Mary Whitehouse to death. I also play uh, Sir Edward Fulbright in this story, <laughs> and uh, um, it was one of those roles, um, a lot like Zed Mantelli in Time of Your Life. I had. Um... I, when I had first read the book, I was like, that's the character I want to play. Um, I really wanted to do this uh, this sort of high-class Victorian asshole type character, and um, and I had a lot of fun doing it with uh, with Fulbright. Fulbright was a ton of fun to do, um, especially when listening back to it, because I recorded it a while back before I, before I actually started editing it. And uh, a lot of the lines, <laughs> a lot of my deliveries, I guess, at the time uh, even surprised me now. Um, and I think he, he he not only is a is a fun character to play, he's incredibly funny too. Um, so just a really fun time, uh, a really fun character to play. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Hello, I am Alex Baxter Scott, and I play Percival Ross in Evolution. He was quite a fun character to play, actually. He was the second role that I have for um, Security Kitchen. The first one was the Major in Transit. Which was a, it was a fun role, especially the first one to like get into um, Security Kitchen's um, group of voice actors and sort of work out how they do scripts, you know, how they do their um, methods for casting and getting the lines out. So it was it was a nice entry point having a sort of small character 
whose accent I don't agree with. I sort of wasn't quite sure what mid-Atlantic sort of thing I was going for then, but Percival Ross was more of a return to form, really, because Victorian scientists are sort of um, doing my own voice, really, just making it posher and more obnoxious. Um, and I found the character really interesting. It was um, curious that as sort of one of not the main antagonists to be revealed in the final episode was um, certainly a bold choice. And um, I think the way that he was written, both on the page of the books and in the script, was um, yeah, a very interesting character. I'm kind of glad in a way that he did appear at the very end because... Oh, he had a lot to say. Um, so for second role for these guys to be faced with a four-page monologue that, um, according to Jacob and Joey, in the original script was all a, a massive exposition dump was, um, well, it was actually really fun. It, it took about an hour to do the whole speech with multiple takes, so uh, whoever's editing this I do feel sorry for. Um, and yeah, that was, um, that was something that I'd always wanted to do, really, to sort of be faced with four pages of dialogue, and it's just like, right, off you go. Try and make this sound coherent and interesting. So I'm, uh, at, at time of recording, I haven't listened, to, uh, haven't listened to the final version because it's still being edited, but um, I'm really looking forward to that. And, um, like, whenever I'm doing these lines, I just imagine myself in the situation, and if it was, if Evolution was a Tom Baker and um, Elizabeth Layton story, the idea of this almost reaching James Bond levels of villainy, sort of like strapping Sarah Jane to an operating table and threatening to vivisect her. If if that was me back in the day, getting you know, the chance to do that with Liz Layden, I would die happy that that would be hopefully what I'd be known for. Um, and finding out that um, you know this is a character who took alien technology, specifically the Rutans, and using it in a very horrific way. Oh, I just loved it, especially knowing that this was a real piece of work character. Apparently I got the role according to Jacob because um, my voice for him was very similar to a character from Critical Role, which I had no idea of, I've only just sort of seen bits and pieces in passing, but if um, if getting crit if nailing characters from Critical Role might um, be the key to unlocking characters in the future, I really should get in on that. Um, and playing it was funny because um, I was actually going off of um, a sort of vague impression of um, the scientist from the Beatles movie Help who's pretty much the a parody of all the mad scientist characters that you've seen in any film before the 1990s really and even then so um, yeah Percival Ross and um, I wouldn't say I miss him because he's not a very pleasant character but um if it turned out that he did survive getting shot or drowned, then uh, I would hope I get first first rights for the character. Uh, this is our first story, at least full time, featuring uh, Brian Corrigan as the Fourth Doctor. Um, I think he does a really great job. Seriously, um, he had uh, he had done uh, the Fourth Doctor voice in our first adaptation for Genesis for a uh, for a brief cameo, and um, and came back later for the one cam cameo scene in. Um, revelation and he did a great job and I, I you know i me and jacob always sort of knew that like if we wanted to keep going with fourth doctor stuff then uh then brian would be our guy and uh, right alongside that we we found the amazing ali e tori to uh to play sarah jane uh and we have a really great team there i think it really creates uh a great dynamic i think they have great chemistry together um great impressionists the both of them and uh we, we really made a uh a really recognizable season 13 team. Hello, I'm Kai and I played Alice. So, Alice's voice is pretty tiring to do. Um, it's like right at the top of my range. If I go any higher, I start sounding like a witch or a cartoon character. <laughs> so it actually took me quite a while to record the lines because I kept having to take breaks and have a drink and basically inhale vocal zone tablets, but we got there in the end. I think a lot of the outtakes that I ditched are just ones where a line is going really well and then all of a sudden you hear the <laughs> of my voice cracking because it's just like, nope, I'm not going any higher, I'm not sustaining that note for any longer. <laughs> One thing that I was a bit worried about with Alice is being a bit one-dimensional. Um, 
I was worried that I would rely too heavily on horror stereotypes of uh, screaming Victorian ladies. <laughs> uh, and to try and stop that from happening and stop myself from playing her too one-dimensionally, I did slightly more character research than usual. For every character I'll sit down and I'll think about the character's past and their motivations and stuff like that, but for Alice I went way more in depth, and it's probably not accurate to the book or anything, but the fact that I know that she likes crochet but is really bad at knitting kind of somehow helped dissipate my fears that she'd be a bit too stereotypical because I knew that about her and somehow that helped. So I guess that's like helpful acting tip. If you're worried that your character's gonna come out as one dimensional and you don't want them to be, do way more character research than usual. <laughs> Another thing that I liked is how her voice ended up sounding next to Bridewell's voice. There's something about the two of them that really bounce off each other really nicely. Yeah, I'm paying my friend a compliment. <laughs> I'm allowed to do that. I really like the journey that Alice as a character goes down because she starts off so timid and so controlled by expectations and by society and essentially by Victorian values, I suppose. And then by the end, just because she's talked to Sarah Jane and been drugged and gone through various adventures, um, she's making her own decisions and she's standing up for herself and it almost felt like I was rescuing her. <laughs> but I suppose Sarah Jane was really in a way. I'm really glad that I decided not to go too posh on the accent. I think if I did it might have stood out a bit too much and it also left room for me to go super heavy on the accent in the next character I play. That's the thing with characters, I tend to not plan them with an accent in mind. I don't think, right, this character needs this accent, unless there are very obvious clues from the story. It usually just kind of falls into place and happens. <laughs> Like, I'll do a few takes, and then an, an accent will, like, emerge. <laughs> and I'll be like, oh, okay, that sounds good. We'll keep recording, we'll keep going with that one then. <laughs> so, those are my thoughts on Alice. Don't forget to subscribe to Security Kitchen. Because if you don't, then a terrifying hybrid of a seal and a child will eat your face. Bye. This is also our second adaptation with original music. Uh, Antonio really stepped up his game for this one. Uh, I'm really happy with the music in the, in the story because uh, it's super atmospheric. I gave Antonio a couple of, like specific points, but he took it and just ran with it. I'm so happy with how the music turned out for this one. Uh, of course, there is a full uh music suite that you could listen to on antonio's channel uh, uh i think his channel's uh yeah crinoid, crinoid roots um spelled like the doctor who monster from season 13 ironically um and uh yeah it's it's a fantastic music suite i highly recommend it and um actually also this cover that you're seeing right now uh for this behind the scenes video is also made by antonio um he's done so much for the adaptations recently and uh he really deserves so much more praise than he gets he's a brilliant person to work with Hello, my name is Marcus Cotton, and I play Inspector Bernard Faversham in Doctor Who Evolution. Wait, was it Bernard, or did we say Bernard? Not important, I'm sure I'll remember later. So, there'd been kind of this running joke at this point in the novel adaptations that I always play the villain. So, for Evolution, I wanted to avoid that as much as possible. I don't even think I auditioned for the villain. Well, I know I didn't, because Faversham is the only character I auditioned for. Um, 
Faversham is a constable character. To make a comparison, because this story features Arthur Conan Doyle, before he wrote Sherlock Holmes, mind you, um, he is essentially the Lestrade to the Doctor's Holmes. Um, and when, you know, the crew was first announcing Evolution, I asked, what is the tone like? Um, and I seem to recall them saying it was a little more lighthearted. Um, so my approach, my idea essentially, was to play Faversham as the type of police character you would see in a cozy mystery. So, you know, like, um, what was his name? Inspector Jap from Poirot, or the various inspectors from Father Brown, or Sheriff's Metzger and Sh Sheriff Metzger and Sheriff Tupper from Murder, She Wrote. You know, that kind of character, not to the point of being bumbling, but to the degree that when they recognize someone, in Evolution's case, the Doctor, is more knowledgeable than them, they will gladly step aside and let that character take over the investigation while still trying to help. And Faversham was very enjoyable. You know, um, I don't know where the inspiration came from to do, to play this character with an Irish accent, but I really think it came out well. I feel like it really brought the character to life and um, sort of created the tone I was going for, again, as a cozy mystery type character. I'm warming up my voice and I sound a bit stupid. Oh, that's going on the outtake, isn't it? <laughs> Curse these squeaky floorboards. Can't we come to some sort of amicable? Alright. Trying again. Really, Edmund, I don't know why you tolerate the man. I do Take care, father. You too, Roger. You too, Roger. You too, Roger. 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 What am I doing? Well, look at the way the bones have been shattered in the face. <laughs> you shall have the room adjoining mine. I'll show you the. You, you, ah, oh, gah. When the cat stops eating, he'll go for another take. <laughs> Isn't this a marvellous affair? Oh, it's so hot in here. Oh, God. Men's clothing? What is this world coming to? <coughs> that actually hurt to say. I'll try that again. I did like that, though. Stop slamming car doors. Don't think I haven't seen the looks you've been getting from some of the fences. <laughs> There's a plane going over, and that definitely should not exist yet. And offhand, I can think of no species of aquatic animal that is native to the earth that might be held accountable. Oh, thank fuck. Whew. Okay. Damn. Don't mind me. Even when I record late at night, stuff like this happens. If Ross... If Ross turns up, I shall... <clears throat> How about you... Oh, for God's sake, if there's another plane that goes over. He was about ready to challenge him to a... D <clears throat> another mystery. Isn't it fun? Right. Leave Grey a note asking him whether... Oh, what the fuck? I'm angry, Joey. I'm very, very angry. Very angry.